So good to be with you all this morning. I'm delighted to be here. I can't tell you how great it is to all these years later see former students like Kyle and Sarah and Jess being so helpful to God's people as they grow and and seeing them serving faithfully like this in a, in a healthy church, in a growing church in the most important ways. So I'm grateful to be here, and it's always a privilege to open God's Word. It's almost 25 years ago, I was standing in front of church at our church in Wheaton when we were living there, and my good friend and mentor, Chris, came up to my friend Mark and me, and he said, have you guys ever read about the Gerasene demoniac? And I said, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And he said, you've got to, and he opened up his Bible to Mark chapter 5, and he read the story to us, and he, he said, this, this is a life-changing passage for me in the Bible that he had read that week, and, and that's where I want to look. I love that you're reading through the Bible. I love this artwork as you're transitioning from the Old to the New Covenant, and I love to be able to dive into a passage like Mark chapter 5 as we are this morning. So would you turn there, please, in your Bibles to Mark 5. We're going to read the first 20 verses of this incredible story of Jesus meeting the Gerasene demoniac, and you might not know what that means, like like me, when I was confronted by my friend Chris about this, but hopefully after the time together in the Word this morning, you will know this man well and learn all God has for us in this passage. Mark chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, let me pray for us. Lord, help us now as we go to your Word to depend on the same Spirit that inspired it, to illumine our minds, change our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would leave here this morning different than when we walked in, closer to you, more aware of the saving power of Jesus than we have ever been before, transformed by the work of the Spirit, according to the Scriptures. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. First thing to know about the country of the Gerasenes is this is Gentile territory. Jesus is a Jew, his disciples are Jews, and Gentiles are unclean. When you're in Gentile country, you've entered unclean country. And the disciples of Jesus were often baffled by why Jesus was always taking them toward the Gentiles. You know, he focused on the Jews throughout his ministry, but there were these times he would take them into places like even Samaria, and they didn't understand why he would go to these places where these unclean Gentiles lived. And he does here to the country of the Gerasenes. Verse 2, and when, he, when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. So we've got ourselves in Gentile territory. And now we've got ourselves in a graveyard, another layer, another level of uncleanness. If you understand the Jewish laws and what ritual purity meant, we're moving into a greater level of impurity. You know, if you've ever been to Jerusalem and gone to the Eastern Gate, you'll, you may know that the Messiah in the Old Testament is said to return from the East and enter Jerusalem in the Eastern Gate. And that's actually the Muslim quarter now. That's Muslim territory. And so knowing that prophecy, do you know what the Muslims did? They put a graveyard in front of the eastern gate. They not only sealed it over with bricks and mortar, they put a graveyard in front of it. So if the Messiah was going to go through the eastern gate, he would have to go through a graveyard and make himself unclean. That's an interesting thing to do, but it's also a misunderstanding of this Messiah because as we see here, this Messiah doesn't save us from a distance. Jesus moves in to the uncleanness of our world so we can be clean. This man was living in a graveyard as a walking dead man. Listen to his condition. And no one, verse 3, 
could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. I was a dean of students at a school for at-risk youth for a few years, and my job was basically to deal with these kids when they got out of control, which happened fairly often. They were at the Founders School is really the last stop before they went to prison. If they couldn't get it done at the Founders School, they were going to end up in prison. And I realized very early on that dealing with these kids who had come from really traumatic backgrounds and had often given themselves to a lot of dark things, that there was a spiritual reality in all of that and a, a demonic influence very often in it. And I will never forget when I tried to hold a young man named Artie down who couldn't have weighed more than 120 pounds. And I, I had just finished playing college football. I was, I was a lot bigger than I am now and a lot stronger than I am now, and I couldn't hold him down at all. He was out of control, and it took four other guys to come in and hold him down. It was so clear to me that he had a, a strength that wasn't just from his little body. It's coming from somewhere else. The powers of darkness can have an effect in this world that are powerful. And we need to realize that. And that's what's going on here. This man is breaking shackles that are put in him. He's out of control. He's living in a graveyard. And he's causing quite a disturbance in this territory. People can hear him from a distance crying out. And they put him in shackles and chains. And he just breaks the shackles and chains. With this demonic power that's taken over in his life into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Self-inflicted destruction. Destruction from influences outside of himself. And there's a complexity to the sin and evil in our world and in our lives we need to understand. Some of it comes from without and we're victims of it. But there's always an aspect of it where we yield to those things. We give ourselves to those things. So at the very same time we're victims and we're to blame for the evil and the sin in our lives. You know, I think it could be helpful to think about where these sinful tendencies and actions and thoughts and these addictive behaviors come from and the things in our lives that have led to these things. But I think it's important to realize that often there's a complexity where we can't understand it. And that's actually the way the Bible talks about the human heart. That it's desperately wicked. Who can understand it? beyond our ability to understand, and I don't need to understand all the complexities of where the sinful realities in my heart come from to flee to Jesus, to recognize I need a Savior. And that's what happens here beautifully. Listen, verse 6. And when, Jesus, and when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So the demon is having a conversation with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, verse 8, was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Another layer of uncleanness. We've got Gentile territory. We've got a graveyard. We've got demon possession going on here. And Jesus has come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And the demon begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs, another layer of uncleanness, if you understand Jewish laws... 
was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were thankful, no, They were fascinated, no. They were worshipful, no. They were afraid. What an odd response to seeing a display of salvation in their midst. And look what happens. And those who had seen it described it to them, what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Isn't that an amazing response? They had tried to subdue this man. They had tried to control him. They had tried everything they were able to do to keep this man from terrorizing their region with this demon-possessed, ravaged soul and body. And a man finally shows up and he brings a power that frees this man from this horrible oppression. And instead of saying, Jesus, you're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one we need. You're the one alone who has the power to save us and save this man. No, they're afraid. And they say, leave. Maybe because 2,000 pigs that was obviously a part of their major industry and their economy just went to their graves in the sea and that was going to really hit their income and maybe that's what really bothered them. I don't know. But it's just astounding to me that the saving power of Jesus gets put put on display like this, a power they had none of. And rather than seeing Jesus as the one they desperately need, they say, get out of here. We don't want you here. And that's still how people respond to Jesus. You know, they want a version of Jesus that just is a nice guy and tells them to uh, consider the lilies. But when it's someone who comes and doesn't just bring some vague spirituality, but brings the power over darkness that we all desperately need, they say, no, I'm not interested. You need to leave. Get out of here. Maybe that's your inclination toward Jesus as you sit here this morning. I'm not sure why you're all here. But how we respond to Jesus when we see his power on display is the question this morning. How will we respond to him? They beg him to leave. So he does. Verse 18, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him. We've got someone else begging but for the very opposite thing. Begged him that he might be with him. Now that's the response, right? When you've been set free from this kind of self-destructive and outside your self-destructive lifestyle, you don't want to get further than a few inches from this man who saved you. And he begs Jesus, can I go with you, please? Can I get in the boat with you? And amazingly, Jesus says no. Apparently, he can still have a relationship with Jesus and have the power he needs in his life and the forgiveness he leads in his life without being in immediate proximity with Jesus. Verse 19, he did not, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And he went away. And he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Have you ever heard somebody say the Bible's boring? (laughs) The Bible's not boring. (laughs) That is incredible. If if you think the Bible's boring, you must not have ever read it. This This is amazing stuff here. And there's seven things I want us to think about going on in this passage. 
The first one that I hope is really obvious is that the spiritual realm is real and it's powerful and it's actually the foundational reality we need to come to terms with. You see, we tend to think just on a surface superficial level, but the Bible over and over again is teaching us, no, there's a spiritual realm and that's this foundational realm that's as real as flesh and blood and it's powerful and it's central to understanding reality. And there are powers of darkness in the spiritual realm and there are great powers of goodness that come from God and the demonic and the satanic in this world is a reality. And we need to come to terms with that. The Bible teaches this so clearly. And Jesus, when he shows up in his ministry, says, this is what I'm doing. And the miraculous, which shows his power over evil, is Jesus saying, I'm taking back my world. I've come to take back the world I created, and that is mine, and it has been under the domain of Satan, and it's time for me to take it back, and that's what he does in his ministry. So when you see Jesus do a miracle like this, or feeding the 5,000, or walking on water, or whatever it is, don't fixate on the miracle. Look at the miracle worker and realize he's saying, I'm taking back my world. It's mine, and I'm the Lord of it, and I'm the king of it, and I'm restoring my kingdom, and I'm taking back my world. That's why he says, when he begins his ministry in Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when he sends his disciples out, they come back pumped that they in his authority now have power over the spiritual realities of darkness and they say Lord in Luke 10 even the demons are subject in your name and he said I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven but then he makes sure they realize what's the priority in their ministry he says nevertheless do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven You see, he redirects their focus from the powers miraculously over evil and says the greatest evil is the sin in your own heart and you can be forgiven of that and your name can be written in heaven. So power over darkness is a wonderful ability we have in the authority of Jesus. But we need to realize that the power of darkness in our own hearts is what we need freedom from. And our primary battlefield is this spiritual realm. This is how Ephesians 6 puts it. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places against the world forces in this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And we tend to gravitate toward just focusing on earthly realities. We think our problems are primarily political or social or psychological or economic. And I'm so thankful for Christians who engage in the political and the economic and the social. Hear me on that. But we need to realize that underneath all of those earthly realities is a spiritual realm where we need to be engaging foundationally. And so, yes, we need to be involved in those earthly realities, but even more importantly, we need to be engaging with the weapons of warfare of the spiritual realities in this world like prayer like lives of righteousness, like the gospel of peace, like the word of God, like the fellowship of the saints. Look, when you gather here, this is a beautiful place and you're beautiful people and it's been so good to get to know some of you this weekend. But when you gather here, please realize, yes, you're to find a home here. You're to find a family. And you're to find a hospital here when you can find healing. But please don't ever forget that when you gather as God's people, when you see yourself as a child of God, you're also a soldier in his army. And you gather here not just to find a home and a hospital and a school where you learn things, but you come here as a barracks where the troops gather and get ready for warfare. Not with the weapons the world fights with, but the weapons God's people fight with that engage in the spiritual realm. We need to take that seriously. I remember reading a book by Paul Miller called A Praying Life. There was one sentence in there, you know, we're raising four kids. 
We adopted three from Taiwan, one from China. They were all older when we adopted them. Came from challenging backgrounds. And so, so I'm always trying with desperate need for wisdom to raise these kids. And Paul Miller says in his book, you have absolutely no right to expect any change in your kid's heart if you're not praying for it daily. Oh, and I realize I preach way more than I pray to my kids. And we need to realize that, that hearts change and, and goodness advances over evil in this world and in our hearts when we pray, when we take the spiritual realm seriously in our world. The spiritual realm is more overtly present today than it's ever been in my lifetime. It was really interesting. When I was a young Christian, I encountered a lot of what we call naturalism that said the spiritual realm doesn't exist, therefore miracles don't happen, people don't rise from the dead and walk on water. But more and more, it's been amazing in my life, uh, people are more and more open to the spiritual realm and the miraculous. And and actually, more and more I meet people who say, okay, I guess somebody can rise from the dead, I I believe in the spiritual realm. But what they want to do is say, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. Don't give me doctrine. Don't give me actual definition to all these things. Because if that happens, I might have to submit to something besides myself. And so the spiritual realm can be really popular. A lot of people want it. And spirituality is wonderful until you actually need real answers and you need real power over spiritual darkness. And then you need the person of Jesus. And you can't have the power without the person. And without God's commandments that go with it. So the first thing is the spiritual realm is real and it's active and it's our primary battlefield. Two, it's important to know that just knowing the truth isn't enough. Isn't it amazing that when Jesus confronts this demon, the demon knows exactly who Jesus is. He says, you're you're the son of the most high God. The demon's problem is not lack of knowledge. It's not inaccurate knowledge. It's knowledge that doesn't lead to a transformed, obedient, worshipful heart. We need to realize that knowing things isn't enough. I think demons could ace all the exams I give in my theology classes at Biola. It's just all that knowledge doesn't transform them into being worshipers. And so we need to be asking God to take the knowledge we have and change us with it into worshipers and true disciples of Jesus. Listen to Luke 4. He confronts a demon in Luke 4 and says, Ha, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. He knows exactly who Jesus is. It's fascinating when you see these scenes where Jesus is with his disciples and the the demons have a better understanding of who he is than the disciples do. They're like, what did that demon just say? Who did he say he was? So knowledge isn't enough. We need to be seeking transformation from the inside out that this knowledge brings. We need the knowledge. Don't get me wrong. But knowing truth isn't enough. We need to be transformed by it. So the spiritual realm is real and powerful. Knowing the truth isn't enough. And three, please realize, as we read this harrowing description of this tragically destroyed man, that we are all like him. And this one's going to take a miracle for us to really believe. You look at this guy. And you're so inclined to put him in some separate category than yourself. And you may have had some really tragic things in your life or destructive experiences in your life, but man, you look at him and you say, wow, he's a lost cause. I I can't even relate to this guy. But what we need to realize is that the way the Bible describes the human condition even though we may not have experienced the kind of dramatic, destructive effects of evil like he has in his life, fundamentally, we're all in the same boat. We're all dead. Listen to how Ephesians puts it. You, in your fallen condition, outside of Christ, without Christ, were dead in your trespasses and sins. 
This man is literally living in a graveyard, and that's this powerful picture of the spiritual deadness within himself that we all equally share in, in our fallen sinful condition. You were dead, not needing better parents, not needing more time or better education or a better political structure. No, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirits that now are at work in the sons of disobedience. You under the powers of satanic darkness outside of Christ. If you're now in Christ, please never forget what you were saved from. If you're outside of Christ, realize that even though your life may have a successful veneer from the world's standards, even though you're here and looking awfully shiny and good and, and you're experiencing all kinds of goodness in this world, realize if you're outside of Christ, the Bible says you're dead. And the one who's calling the shots in your life is none other than the leader of the powers of darkness the Bible calls Satan. I don't know if that all sounds crazy to you, but that's how the Bible describes our condition. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You know, I teach mostly students at Biola who were raised in Christian families. They went to church most of their life. The vast majority of my students have been Christians as long as they can remember. And they, a lot of them went to Christian schools through or homeschooled. And, and it can be really hard for them to identify with this guy. Because they can't remember a time they weren't in Christ. But if we don't remember who we were before God saved us, we're not going to see the grace of the gospel is truly amazing. We're, if we don't really realize what we were saved from, we're going to look at some people and think they needed Jesus more than we did. We're going to look at some people with a judgmental air that says, man, I might have been messed up, but that guy's really messed up. And we can even become hopeless for people. And pharisaical and self-righteous looking at them. But we're all in this situation together. Can you relate to the man of the tombs? Even if you've been a Christian for 60 years, can you look at him and say, that's who I was? My body may have not had open wounds and scars on it from stones that I had used to inflict punishment on my body. I might not have had wounds and bruises from chains I ripped open, but I was a dead man before Jesus gave me life. I was blind before he gave me sight. I was hopeless before he gave me hope. You see, that's what it means to be a Christian, to know that apart from Christ, there's nothing good in you and nothing Godward. And Jesus comes and he saves you. And none of us has been more radically saved than anybody else. If you're saved this morning, This is a picture of Ginny Burton. Ginny experienced horrible abuse when she was a little girl. And Ginny gave herself to all sorts of evil as well. And this is Ginny Burton after her life was completely transformed. when she graduated from the University of Washington. And this is Ginny Burton as a little girl. But when you see her in this picture, what do you see? Do you see somebody different than you in a fundamental way. Well, see, the Bible puts us all in the same situation before God. Children of wrath, sons of disobedience, dead in your transgressions and sin, and you may never have been a meth addict. But fundamentally, we're all in the same place. Listen to what Ginny Burton said. 
These are her words. I am that person. I have 17 felony convictions. I'm the person you used to clutch your bag for when I walked by you. I'm the person that would randomly attack somebody in public. I was not a good person. Everybody was a victim and everybody was prey. When you're stuck on the streets and you smell like feces and you haven't showered in forever and you can't make it into a social service during working hours because they're too busy trying to feed your addiction and your addiction's bigger than you and you've compromised your integrity a number of times over and over again and you're starting to be victimized by people on the streets, you're hopeless. You can't stand your life. You'd rather be dead than alive. I spent most of my addiction wishing that somebody would just blow me away. We need to face the truth about ourselves. She says, nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings. Everybody wants to be loving and supportive, which means we don't hold up a mirror to people. We don't want to tell people they can't do this. We're just going to support them to death. We're going to love them to death. It's not love. I'm grateful the Pierce County Sheriff loved me enough to arrest me. I'm grateful that the judges loved me enough to incarcerate me because those incarcerations gave me an opportunity to work myself into a changed life. See, it's so easy to see somebody like Ginny Burton in that first photograph and see them as different, but she is the man of the tombs walking the streets of, in the state of Washington. And she's not in some different category than any of us. Do you know that the most at-risk group in our country is preteens and teens from affluent, well-educated families? In spite of their economic and social advantages, this article tells us, children of affluence experience the highest rates of depression, substance abuse, anxiety disorders, body image complaints, and unhappiness of any group of children. 22% of adolescent girls from financially comfortable families suffer from clinical depression. This is three times the national rate of depression for adolescent girls. Things are not always as they seem. If you put yourself in a different category than Jenny Burton or the man of the tombs, you're not. When you see this picture of her, it's easy to see someone made in the image of God that you're inclined to love and care for. But we need to see people that way no matter how they look on the surface. No matter how they're living in the moment. And we need to realize that for all of us, sin is destructive. The, ba the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And we're all dead in our sin until Jesus frees us. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's point number four. Sin is always destructive. Point number five is Jesus alone has the power and the compassion to save you. Ephesians says we're dead in our trespasses and sins under the powers of darkness. It's as bad as it can be, but then thankfully in verse four it says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God so that no one may boast for his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. One day Jesus will once and for all conquer all the powerful spiritual pow forces of darkness. But along the way, he's claiming lives, just like he's claimed the lives of so many of you in here. And it, the way he claimed my life and gave me life, and we need to realize that that day has not come yet, but we are the people who have been reclaimed by Jesus and brought out of our sinful condition. This is why my friend Chris came to me with his eyes wide that Sunday morning to tell me about the Gerasene demoniac because Chris and his wife had a son who had given himself over and had been abused by the world in a way where it became a nightmare every day to be the parents of this young man. 
It was devastating. And Chris it was, it was on the verge of hopelessness so often. And he came to us and he said, this morning I read the story of the Gerasene demoniac. And I realized that that's my boy. My son is the man of the tombs. And there's hope for him. Just like there was for that man. And that hope is in Jesus. And I have a renewed hope for my boy. That God will save him. He's not beyond God's reach. My son is the man of the tombs. And, and, and Chris said, and I was the man of the tombs. Josh is not some different category than I was. He seems like such an extreme case, but before God and our sinful condition, we're all desperately needing Jesus. And what we need to realize, point six, is the way Jesus saves us from the graveyard is by walking right into it himself. Jesus becomes the man of the tombs, literally. He dies in our place and he's buried in a graveyard and his resurrection power brings him to life and gives us freedom from the power of sin, death, hell, and the grave. He's punished in our place and he moved into the uncleanness of our world right into a graveyard and right into death itself so that he could save us. He's the man of the tombs. And that's how he frees us from the grave. My friend Chris that morning said, and do you know Bob Bennett, the musician? I don't know if you know Bob Bennett. He's a phenomenal Christian man and musician. But he wrote a song about this man in Mark 5 called The Man of the Tombs. Let me read the lyrics to you of Bob Bennett's song. Man of the Tombs. He lives in a place where no one goes. And he tears at himself and lives with a pain that no one knows. He counts himself dead among the living. He knows no mercy and no forgiving. Deep in the night, he's driven to cry out loud. Can you hear him cry out loud? Man of the tombs, possessed by an unseen enemy. He breaks every chain and mistakes his freedom for being free. Shame and shamelessness equally there. Like a random toss of a coin in the air. Man of the tombs, he's driven to cry out loud. Underneath this thing I've become, a fading memory of the flesh and blood. I curse the womb. I bless the grave. I've lost my heart. I cannot be saved. Like those who fear me, I'm afraid. Like those I've hurt, I can, fe I, I can feel pain. Naked now before my sin and these stones that cut against my skin. Some try to touch me, but no one can. For man of the tombs I am. Down at the shoreline, two sets of footprints meet. One voice is screaming. The other voice begins to speak. In only a moment, in only a word, the evil departs like a thundering herd. Man of the tombs, he hears this cry out loud. Underneath this thing that you've become, I see a man of flesh and blood. I give you life beyond the grave. I heal your heart. I come to save. No need to fear. Be not afraid. This man of sorrows knows your pain. I came to take away your sin and bear its marks upon my skin. When no one can touch you, still I can. For son of God, I am. Dress now and seated, clean in spirit and healthy of mind. Man of the tombs, he begs to follow, but must stay behind. He'll return to his family with stories to tell of mercy and madness of heaven and hell. Man of the tombs, soon he will cry out loud. Underneath this thing that I once was, now I'm a man of flesh and blood. I have a life beyond the grave. I found my heart. I can now be saved. No need to fear. I'm not afraid. This man of sorrows took my pain. He comes to take away our sin and bear its marks upon his skin. I'm telling you this story because this man of the tombs, I was. When God saves you like that, last point seven, you tell other people. And that's why Jesus redirects this man. He says, go home and for the first time in who knows how long, have a meal with your family. Be restored to society once again. But tell them, 
how Jesus saved you. And that's the last point. When you've been saved by Jesus from certain eternal death and judgment, you tell people. And if you've come to salvation, it's because someone told you, and we need to have a renewed evangelistic zeal in our lives because we realize afresh how much Jesus has saved us from. So let's preach the saving power of Jesus from the rooftops. And if you've never trusted Jesus, even if you drove in here in the most expensive Tesla going and your life looks so good, you're dead until you find life in Jesus. Your life is on the path of destruction apart from the author of life and the savior of the world. Lord, help us to understand and appreciate the gospel like never before. Help us to see ourselves all, just like this man, desperately needy for the savior who is Jesus. And Lord, if we have trusted Jesus this morning, I pray that you would help us to delight in and be more grateful than ever for how powerfully Jesus has saved us from sure and certain death and destruction. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.